So we go back now to talking about the liturgical disciplinary changes being enacted by St. Pius V. Talked about you know, yesterday his bull, quo primum, by which he promulgated the the missal that is now, of course, not referred to as the Tridentine missal because it was in accordance with the uh, decrees of the Council of Trent that it should be done. Again, not that a pope is absolutely bound to following the disciplinary decrees of a council, but it happened. It was a good idea. It was um, those. Uh, those decrees made sense, the motives for them were good, so St. Pius V puts those into effect. He has the missile promulgated and says that in any rite that's uh, less than 200 years old has to be abolished after that, and everyone has to follow that. Again, more than 200 years old, uh, it's, can, it can survive, you know, it's allowed to survive, uh, any uh, rights that were older than that were, or people who used rights that were older than that were allowed to give up what they had been doing, had been using, and use the, now the, the Tridentine Missile, the Roman Missile. But mm, they weren't obliged to do that. It was only rights that were less than 200 years old. So, another question of discipline that had been touched on by the Council of Trent was that of church music. So Pope Marcellus II, whom we touched on earlier, uh, had thought of uh, uh, banishing polyphony uh, entirely from uh, liturgical uh, functions. Uh, but it was actually uh, a famous composer of polyphony. Any guesses as to his name? <laughs> Yes, who composed a mass that's now called the Mass of Pope Marcellus, Misa Pape Marcelli, the sisters actually sing it sometimes. And it was that uh, that prevailed upon Pope Marcellus II to not ban polyphony. He liked it enough. He said, okay, it can survive. It's allowed. It's allowed to survive after that. So St. Pius V continued to uh, support Palestrina's uh, his work and to, uh, in a sense, be his patron. So that was another thing that, uh, uh, so, yeah, Pius V uh, enacted uh, certain things. Um, as I recall, it, I know at a certain point, I believe it was Pius V, it's not mentioned, but D Daras doesn't mention it, but uh, I believe it was Pius V who eliminated what is called the, the troping in the chant. In other words, uh, sometimes you'll see the like, titles of the different masses, say in the Liber, uh, like, um, I can't remember the titles of them, but sometimes they would have, I like, say, um, like, uh, say, the mass, I forget, I forget which mass title it, was, it is, but it gives you a title, one of the masses, one of the numbers, and then has underneath Kyrie, gives you something like, uh, um, uh, omnipotens, uh, factor omnipotens, or something like that. But anyway, the reason that that's there is because that used to be worked into the chant of the Kyrie. When the chant was long, that would be worked into the chant to like, fill in the gap so you wouldn't be singing the same syllable for many notes. You would instead sing those other words. But that that was put in it. St. Pius V. I believe it was St. Pius V who put an end to that. I haven't actually read that, at least not in Daras, but I, I believe that is the case. It, certainly that was done away with at some point. It's not permitted anymore. But that's, uh, that's, um, but that, that in any case, that's the reason why you find those, those alternate titles for the masses. In fact, it's a similar thing that, uh, that's, that's the, the origin of the sequences, is that those used to, those originated as tropes for a very, very long ending of the Alleluia, which is why you see at the end of, say, the Stalat Mater, there's an Alleluia at the end of it. Uh, that, that's the reason for it, because it's, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not joyful. <laughs> and everything talked about in the Stabat Mater is not joyful. The reason is because it, it, it started out as troping that was inserted into the Alleluia at a high mass. That's why you find it there. Yeah, the origin of it. It's not, it's not considered that anymore, which is why it's still permitted to be sung, even if it required at sun masses. Not that we sing them here, because that's a, that's a newer office. And generally, those generally don't have chant, which is as nice 
but that is the the origin of sequences and of the uh, that's and the reason why the Stabat Mater has an Alleluia at the end of it. So, I mean, had we turn now again to the continuing spread of Lutheranism, its multiplication to various other sects. Uh, of course, Lutheranism had opened up many uh, venues for all kinds of ideas to spring up and form their own sects. You might say it had opened new ways of independence in a bad sense, into which were pouring all of the self-confident minds which were arrayed in rebellion against the church. So uh, many, many different sects are, were springing up already, and we're still, we're still within the century uh, in the century within which Martin Luther had made himself famous, or infamous, rather. But even within that century, we're already seeing uh, a multiplication of these sects. So at this time, there was a heretic named Socinus, uh, and who was followed by his nephew Faustus, whose erroneous doctrine is known by their name as Socinianism, so I study the errors of Socinianism. They taught that sacred scripture is the only rule of faith and its only interpreter, the light of human reason. And with regard to that, they're more or less in line with Luther, but they drew their own conclusions, such as that all mysteries must be rejected from the very fact that, that they are mysteries and that therefore reason cannot comprehend them. So uh, anything that uh, human reason cannot fathom, essentially, they reject. And they even denied creation. They said uh, they could not conceive how God could give, could give being to substances by the only act of his will. So they were too stupid to understand that God has the power to create, so therefore they decided that creation must be false. They couldn't understand how God could draw something from nothing. So therefore, they decided that must not be the case. That's how bright they were. They also rejected the dogmas of original sin, the divinity of Christ, and of the redemption. The only sacraments which they allowed were baptism, and as they called it, the Lord's Supper. Though they granted them no other virtue than that of exciting uh, faith. So the resurrection of the body, and that especially, of course, is what happened at the end of the world for everybody, they reject as an impossibility, and presumably they didn't understand that either, how that could be. They do not admit the, they, or they did not admit the doctrine of eternal punishments, but teach or taught that after a greater or lesser duration, all created beings will return to nothing. So... Orgoglio essentially made him, declared himself a Socinian some years ago. He said, oh yes, he, uh, no, nobody goes to hell, evil souls are, no, evil people, the souls of evil people are simply annihilated after they die. So, I don't know. That's, that's, the, that's straight out of these heretics right here. Whether he probably doesn't know that, he's probably not that smart. He's probably never studied history, but uh, in any case, he's not the first one to say that. And also by the Socinians. Socinianism. Oops. So they also, the other things they held, other random ideas they came up with, uh, were that it is not lawful to make war. So they were pacifists. It was not also, they said, to, lawful to appeal to the law for the reparation of an injury. 
so you can't sue people, I guess. <laughs> it's, and it's in, intrinsically immoral in their, in their minds. To swear before a magistrate, and that means to take an oath. That doesn't mean to use foul language. Everybody <laughs> would probably agree that that's, that that is illicit. But this, uh, again, in English, some, for some reason, the word swearing has become applied to using foul language. Whereas to the meaning of swearing an oath, that's, that's something that can be legitimate. Uh, if you're swearing for to have a good reason to swear to something and you're swearing to something true, there's no sin there. But for some reason, that it took on a, another meaning that sometimes sounds funny if you apply the wrong one in the, in the, in the context. Uh, they also said that you could not discharge the office of a judge, especially in criminal cases, or to kill a robber or a murderer, even in lawful self-defense. So basically, there's no such thing as just war or legitimate self-defense in any way. If someone wants to kill you, you just have to let them do it, I guess. Presumably, they were never in that situation themselves, <laughs> to say that, but you never know. They have been crazy enough to actually do that. So these, the, these two were natives of Vincenza, but they, but they taught their errors in Switzerland. And they were so bad that they were proscribed by the government of Geneva, which, remember, is the capital of Calvinism. So they, they were crazy enough that even the Calvinists said, we don't want you. So they went to Poland, where their sect soon numbered many followers. So for whatever reason, their errors took root in Poland. So that's Socinianism. Another error sprang up, also from the teachings of Luther. So similar to Socinianism, a similar origin. Uh, but it was introduced by uh, Michael Bayus. Michael Bayus, who was a chancellor of the University of Louvain. And also, the <laughs> Louvain was one of the origin, uh, points of origin of the new theology in the 19th or the 20th century. Uh, you know, the, it was part of the rebirth of modernism after St. Pius X had it shut down, condemned, uh, came back, and one of its centers of origin was the University of Louvain. And this is, and he's in it, where it's, this is long, long before any of that, but still you already have somebody at that same place who's misbehaving. And also another one of the points of origin was a place called Sochoir. But there was one person who came from there who is uh, famous, at least in the traditional movement, was also very good. Anybody know who that was? It's Bishop Gerard de Lorquier studied there. Again, he is probably more bad, <laughs> at least in the 20th century, more bad came from there than good. But uh, he studied there. The fact remains. All right, so anyway, the, the, back to bios or bianism, as it's now, now has come to be known. Uh, his doctrine views human nature in three states of innocence. I'm oh, sorry, in the three states, first of innocence, the, the second of the fall, and the third of reparation. So he, has, uh, he, uh, he divides his, his ideas. He, for, he says that the state of innocence presents nature in its perfect integrity, free from concupiscence, endowed with immortality, predestined to the intuitive vision of God, gifted with the virtues of hope and charity. Secondly, the fall, by destroying this beautiful harmony, deprived man of all these gifts. And now nature, subjected to concupiscence, has no other power than that of committing sin, and liberty no longer exists. He says that man acts under the impulse of an irresistible constraint. So you can really see how he's, he's coming from Luther in this. And then he says, in the state of reparation, man receives two graces, one of which communicates the Holy Ghost or grace to the soul and raises it above concupiscence. The other is the imputation of the merits of Jesus Christ to pay the debt of sin. 
So then further on, he says that uh, the first grace establishes man in a kind of equilibrium between chastity and concupiscence. And by yielding an inevitable obedience to one of these powers, one of these two powers which prevails, man does it without violence or any sort of coercion, does it involuntarily, and that is the extent of his liberty. So it's like he says, essentially, you choose one or the other. You choose to sin or you choose to, to, you know, to be good. And that, uh, once you choose one or the other, that's it. That's all the liberty you have. That's bias. Of course, other problems with things he's saying, but we'll go through those in a minute. He says that the imputation of the merits of Christ is not made to all without a distinction, but only to the predestined. So in saying that he does, he says that the redemption was universal, but in saying that he's speaking of the intrinsic value of the precious blood and not of a help that is given to all. So essentially he's uh, saying that um, uh, they, they could, um, uh, the precious blood could uh, redeem the, those who are, who are wicked, but it doesn't. And <laughs> Uh, basically that you, know, you could never be, if, you're going, if you've chosen to be sinful, you could never be in the state of grace ever. Uh, so he says, from these principles, he concludes that in the natural order, no action is morally good, that all the actions of infidels are sins. You may remember that the Council of Trent expressly condemned that that God commands things which are impossible to those who do not have grace, that good works have no efficacy to save us from eternal or even from temporal punishment, which could not be without the previous imputation of the merits of Jesus Christ. So this, this, all, this all this stuff, all these doctrines, uh, which its advocates had the boldness to put forward as the teaching of St. Augustine, was comprised in 76 propositions conde uh, condemned by a bull of Pius V in 1567. So all of that is condemned. <laughs> Again, not necessarily, I, you'd have to look at the decree to, the, to see whether every word of it is uh, considered heresy or what degree of censure it gets, and if it's specified which each one gets, but uh, they're all condemned. So, of course, he's, he's saying, and so if we go through this a little bit more, uh, he says that he's talking about the state of, of innocence is nature in its perfect integrity. Of course, uh, you, might, you might read St. Thomas talks about the, uh, the state of pure nature, which is actually a state, it's, it's just something, something theoretical. Uh, nobody ever actually existed in the state of pure nature. Of course, Adam and Eve were created with grace. It was not in all everything that they uh, that they had, you know, all of you know, all grace and uh, all of the uh, the virtues and everything. Of course, that's a gift from that's a gift from God. It's not it's not like that was due to nature in any way. Um, and then you can see with regard to that, that's that's. I mean, just going through these briefly, that's a problem with his ideas on the state of innocence. And then talking about the fall. Uh, he says uh, that, of course, liberty no longer exists. It's false, and someone may commit sin or even live for sin in many years, but you know, with, with the help of grace, you could still convert. It's not like you commit one mortal sin, and that's it, obviously. <laughs> obviously, that's not true. Otherwise, the sacrament of penance would not exist. And then, uh, yeah, and yes, in, in regard to the ideas of, of reparation, yes, he falls into the, so the errors of Luther that, and, and we're that were not really repaired in a sense, that were just the, the merits of Christ are imputed to us and cover us up, cover up our rot, this is idea. So it's really very similar to Luther in that way. And then also the idea that the redemption was, or he says the redemption was universal, but uh, that he says that they're, uh, uh, again, again, he's coming up with his own system, uh, but the, the truth is that, of course, that Christ died for everybody, and that, in fact, you know, this is going into more of the uh, more dogmatic things, but something you things you cover more in dogmatic theology. But again, God does have the let me say the antecedent will that everybody be saved, and you see a lot more of this in the theology courses. Uh, of course, in fact, not everybody is, but still, the redemption was for everybody. Uh, 
So again, yeah, you'll see more on that in your <laughs> other courses. Um, okay, so then it was a few years after condemning that, and then 1572 that St. Pius X, or St. Pius V rather, died on the 1st of May, again the year 1572. Uh, he was beatified uh, exactly 100 years later, in 1672, by Pope Clement X, and canonized, or sorry, beatified by Pope Clement X, and canonized by Pope Clement XI in 1712. So he was mourned in Rome and, of course, throughout all of the Christian world, but the Turks celebrated it with public rejoicings, celebrated his death with public rejoicings in Constantinople. So it seems they really blamed him for their defeat at the Panther. So you know, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about all of the problems that, uh, of course, built up to everything that was happening during his pontificate, but in the midst of all of that, there were a number of saints, even great saints, and uh, learned, man, learned men in every rank of society, like St. Philip Neri and St. Camillus of Lelis. They founded uh, a, care of, or a congregation of clerics for the care of the sick. They lived during this time. Uh, and Cardinal Baronius worked on his task of writing the annals of the church, ecclesiastical annals, and in response to the centuriators of Magdeburg, we talked about them before. The Protestant apologists, basically. Or Protestant church historians, if you want to call them that. Uh, he, he wrote that in response to them. Uh, he also had St. Pascal Bailon, who was a poor shepherd in Aragon, who, uh, uh, Dara says, won the kingdom of heaven while tending his flocks. There was a Saint Benedict, Saint Benedict of Philadelphia, who was born in Ethiopia, but then lived in Sicily under the habit of the miners of the, uh, uh, of the strict observance, so the friar's minor. He was a Franciscan of the strict observance. There was Saint Francis Caracciolo, who founded the uh, order of minor clerics at Naples. There was St. Bartholomew of the Martyrs, Archbishop of Braga, who lived in Portugal. Florence was glorified in St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi and St. Catherine of Ricci. So St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, someone who's Saint, whom St. Alphonsus quotes often in his works. And the Society of Jesus was uh, active at the time. The Jesuits were presenting to... Uh, the youth, Christian youth, I um, uh, see admirable examples of all the virtues that adorned this particular age. And you can see, here we see the, the Jesuits beginning to do what they did well, and that was catechizing education. They were very good at that, which is part of the reason why certain monarchs wanted them banned, and part of the reason why some monarch later on, later centuries, wanted them to be not abolished. <laughs> Uh, well, why some wanted to be abolished and others not, so for the same reason that some saw that they were very good at educating the youth and that they were therefore preventing them from being imbued with revolutionary principles. Uh, one of them shut down because that others saw they're doing a good job educating, we want that. <laughs> and so prevented them from being uh, shut down in, again, in certain countries as a result. But again, we're seeing here that they're, they're really getting into their stride in that. So then, among, among, the, uh, among the Jesuits who were famous at this time, uh, Saint Stanislas Koska, of course in Poland, and a Saint Aloysius Gonzaga, whose stained glass window is in the refectory. And then also, another, another Jesuit, uh, Saint Francis Borgia, forsook the high dignities and brilliant honors which were lavished upon him in the court of Spain, and entered the Society of Jesus, so he became a Jesuit also, which he afterwards governed as its third general. Does anybody remember how his conversion came about? Yes. Oh, so he was Queen Isabel. <laughs> yes, he was the one who was 
uh, Craig, because he was a high-ranking member of the court. He had, you know, he was personally familiar with the monarchs. Say, uh, Queen Is uh, Isabel died. He was the one who was, you know, I guess, at her burial, was tasked with making sure that they're actually burying the right person. That you know, she hadn't faked, because you know, monarchs sometimes do that, fake their deaths and then you know, run away or something, and then have someone else, either an uh, empty casket buried or, or have somebody else buried in their places. That happened. So he was tasked with making sure that they were actually burying the right person. So then he was, <laughs> he saw her, uh, her dead body which was in whatever state of decay it was in at the time and that shook him considerably <laughs> and uh, he was he was uh, you know, reputedly um, vastly overweight and everything at the time you know, he was just a worldly courtier at the time and after that he had his conversion and became saint francis borgia after that <laughs> so that's that was that's his story famous conversion story so and I'm not saying he was any kind of heretic, but you know, conversion from being just a, a perhaps a ca practicing Catholic to some degree to being a, a saint. <laughs> and also at this time, you had St. Robert Bellarmine, of course, who was a cardinal and a theologian. He wrote his work, The Controversies. Uh, then another famous Jesuit, one who was not canonized, was Suarez, who lived at this time, who was, you know, you know, as someone who caused a lot, caused a lot of trouble in, in dogmatic theology courses, <laughs> from the errors he came up with. It's it's not to uh, attack. He wasn't he wasn't a heretic or anything. He just happened to be wrong on a lot of controverted points. He was, by all accounts, he was very pious personally, but he was never canonized. But Jesuits follow him because he was a Jesuit. <laughs> In controversies, they follow him. And then also, you have Louis of Granada, again, someone who is not canonized, nor, I believe, a Jesuit. Um, so he he's comes after the listing of all of them. But a famous you know, a spiritual author, Louis of Granada, uh, who wrote his ascetical works, among which was one called The Sinner's Guide, and then, of course, Saint Teresa of Avila was uh, was during this uh, lived during this time. And you know, we don't have time here, of course, to go through her entire life. But she was she was very active. Uh, she was she went around founding many many convents of the of uh, the uh, Reformed Carmelites. We had her life read last year, so those of you who were here last year will have heard that already. But if not, then you could find it. I believe the author was William Thomas Walsh. The, the author who is uh, uh, the the author who wrote that particular biography, and it was very thorough. And so, those of you who I'm, I'm sure it's in the library. So, if anybody wants to uh, read that particular work, it's available. So, in some of her famous works were *The Way of Perfection*, *The Interior Castle of the Soul*. Uh, she even wrote her own work on her own life. And she also wrote poems. So, of course, when you think of St. Teresa, the writing of St. Teresa, you think also of the writings of St. John of the Cross, whose feast was fairly recently. I don't remember the date, but it was fairly recent. And he did for the Carmelite monks what St. Teresa was doing for the nuns at that time. All right, so then that, that's the, you know, an overview you know, of the reign of St. Pius V. Again, don't get the idea that however much to tell we cover, that we're covering everything that there is to cover during these reigns. Not nearly, especially not at this time. There's so much going on. We're covering all of the major points as quickly as we can while you still get some idea of what was happening. Uh, so, again, that's, that's all that we'll see this year, anyway, of St. Pius V. Um, but actually, I already have plans for circling back, cover some more things from Martin Luther, some things that I, some other material that I have that I didn't work into when we covered it, when we're covering his life very closely. So I'll, maybe next class, we only have a few classes left. I think we have maybe, because next, next week is Feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's on Tuesday. So we only have uh, about uh, three hours of class left, I think. Looked and I counted correctly, so uh, you know, it's good that we've covered as much as we have. I mean, covered over 160 pages in my notes. <laughs> so we've done a lot this year, but we still have a couple hundred years to go. 
before the end of the year. So a hundred, couple, couple hundred years to get through. Okay, so now we move on to Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Dates uh, May thirteenth, fifteen seventy two. to April 7th, 1585. So a good 13 years. Does anybody know off the, off the top of his head one thing that Pope Gregory the Thirteenth is especially famous for? Use something used every single day. He's responsible for it, yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's because of him that this works, basically, as well as it does. <laughs> so yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to covering that. All right, so then his name was Cardinal uh, Ugo Boncompagno. That was his birth name, Ugo Boncompagno. He succeeded St. Pius V on the 13th of May, 1572 at the very time when France was startled by the news of the massacre of St. Bartholomew. And so we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, this is back to the wars of religion in France that are going on. So remember, the Calvinists had obtained the royal signature to the Treaty of Saint-Germain only through the necessity in which the court was then placed of securing peace at any cost. So remember, we covered that earlier. They, grant, they were given some concessions which usually, you know, usually concessions of treaties like that consisted of a freedom to practice their heresy openly. But as also typically happens after receiving those uh, concessions, they were not satisfied with them. And their intrigues continued. So they formed a plot to murder King Charles IX of France and his mother, during the festivities, attending the marriage of the King of Navarre, so again, that's uh, Henry IV, or uh, will become Henry IV of France, with Margaret, the sister of Charles. So there's a wedding, a wedding feast going on. And they want to, they want to murder the monarchs. When they have the large crowds, it's easy to, for an assassin to slip in and get a shot. Yeah, that's what happened to the. Uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, uh, that, started, that was the, it started the First World War. It, he was uh, being driven through the streets of uh, Sarajevo in um, let's the map. Uh, it's, it's not it, that, that's too far in the future. <laughs> Doesn't warrant dragging that map down here. But anyway, he was <laughs> being driven around in that city, and they t his driver took a wrong turn or something. So he had to stop the car, turn around, and the assassin was right there. Didn't take any skill, he just put out a gun and shot him. <laughs> It was five feet away. <laughs> Incredible coincidence. <laughs> there's no, even if the driver was in on it, which as far as I know, there's no evidence that he was. It's just how he could have planned that. <laughs> how they would take her that, exactly that wrong turn and turn around exactly that right spot. Anyway. But anyway, um, uh, that's what they're trying to do this time, use the crowds. Again, they were able to do that because you know, the Archduke visiting, uh, the Crown Prince was visiting this big city. So the assassins slipped in. And you know, that's 1914 here. We're still in. We're in 1572, there's the same trick. They're using the crowds to get the assassins in to try to assassinate the monarchs. Uh, at least that was the official account sent to all the foreign courts on the day following what is known as the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. And see, that's plausible because it's a con very common tactic. So the council had been discussing the course to be followed with regard to the Huguenots. So Catherine had said, uh, to avert the evils which threaten the kingdom, the only, infallible ex the only and the infallible expedient would be to put the admiral to death. Remember, uh, Coligny was the Protestant admiral. He is the cause and the author of these civil wars. The, the designs of the Huguenots would perish with him. 
And the Catholics, satisfied with the sacrifice of one or two men, would remain true to the king's authority. So also, just, just a word on all this stuff of granting concessions to heretics and whatnot. It, is, uh, it may happen that a, a Catholic state may sometimes, a Catholic ruler may have to sometimes uh, not, not give any sort of positive permission to, but simply tolerate the practice of some kind of heresy, uh, her, open, the, even the open practice of heresy in his territory, just for the sake of averting some greater evil. Again, a, a toleration, not a positive permission cannot be protected or supported in any way. But if they have their own resources and they're able to uh, practice it publicly, that may sometimes have to be tolerated. <laughs> Remember the sense toleration is, uh, means or it's become like a, it's become like a, 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 a virtue <laughs> in today's world. It's a, tolerance is a virtue. It's not. It's something, tolerance is, uh, you know, it means essentially to suffer some evil for the sake of averting some greater evil. And, and as, as would be the case in you know, monarchs or any ruler of a Catholic country permitting heresy to be practiced openly. Again, not permitting, but tolerating, allowing it to go without any sort of positive hindrance. Maybe they're, they're letting it go just because if they tried to shut it down, then they might have a civil war on their hands or something like that, these rulers. So that's the reason uh, that, that that is in itself permissible. But then they can't say you are you are free to practice your religion, and that's 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 like a, that's a right, and uh, it's a, you know, you pr that's protected by the state. They can't do that. So again, that's what they're planning. <laughs> to do in France. Uh, again, so I'll put that on hold. So meanwhile, uh, Elizabeth of England, of course now we call her Elizabeth I, uh, was staining the soil of England with the blood of her Catholic subjects. Uh, so among her uh, victims were uh, even high rank so high-ranking people, uh, Henry Percy, who was the Earl of Northumberland, and his son, uh, who was also an Earl, who were the first, uh, uh, the Earl of Arundel, the first peers of the realm. But, <laughs> Daros puts it, the, the, but the missionaries were the objects of special hatred to the cruel daughter of Henry VIII. So she went after anybody who was really a Catholic, but, uh, or even prominent ones, but especially she went after those uh, religious clergy who were trying to keep the faith alive in the country. So executions began in 1577, and the most barbarous tortures were inflicted upon faithful Catholics to force them into apostasy. So some of those we may have already read about in the refectory, but some of them I remember off the top of my own head from other sources. Or uh, they, remember she would, they had this thing where they would uh, tie people's limbs to like four different horses and have the horses run off in different directions and basically tear the person apart. And so also some tortures that they would put them in some kind of, put people in some kind of either a cell or some kind of a, like a frame in which you couldn't, couldn't either fully stand up or really sit down either. And they would just keep them in that for long periods of time. Yes. I think, yes, I think that's what it's called. Yes. I think, but they also, they may have put the thing in a, itself a room that was too small to stand up in. Because that, that name sounds familiar. Anyway, those are just some of the nice things they came up with. I mean, you'd have to have a depraved mind to come up with the things they came up with. It's like, it's like a sort of like, like a hellish ingenuity <laughs> that went into inventing those things. Yeah, maybe they could have put that inventive skill to something useful, but no, they've been put into just inflicting as much torture as possible f as a punishment for adhering to the Catholic faith as they could. Anyway... Of course, Ireland was not spared uh, these, these persecutions. Uh, and where the persecution lasted, of course, centuries. Uh, and for Staros writing in, in the 19th century says that the persecution has lasted through three centuries and still continues with bloodshed, prescriptions, and spoliation of every kind. So these can continue for a long time. 
which is part of the reason why Irish got to the point where well, a couple of you may have heard these stories, but uh, for example, that's why the uh, Irish have developed the custom of, of bowing their heads at the elevation of the host at mass instead of I mean, the whole point that it's elevated so that you can see it and adore uh, the host, the sacred host after, after it's been consecrated. But they started looking down so that they could tell if they ran into the police that day, they could say, we have not seen the host today. They could say that truthfully. Through the use of mental reservation, but they could say it truthfully. We have not seen the host today because they would bow their heads down at the consecration so they wouldn't see it. So they would say that. And it, I mean, that, yeah, that's legitimate use of mental reservation. <laughs> say something that, that's true, that has an, an ambiguous meaning, but uh, could be taken in a wrong way and allow someone, you say it, you allow someone to take it the wrong way and don't correct him for a serious reason. That's that's legitimate use of mental reservation. Of course, they had serious reason because they'd probably be killed if they said, "Yes, I went to mass today." They'd be they, whoever said it would be shot, and also they'd find out where the priest is and kill him too. So, yeah, there's the use of uh, legitimate use of mental reservation there, and then also they had the. Uh, oh, that's why they uh, Irish typically uh, liked like low masses and say their and say their rosaries during low masses because that was all they were used to through centuries of persecution. There was and under those circumstances, there's no possibility whatsoever for high masses, no possibility. So they just got used to all they knew was low masses and they would say their rosary during the mass because and other they wanted to be seen also with their rosaries because so that would be a sure sign that they were Catholics. So that's what they got used to. And that's what. Yeah, to this day, people of Irish descent like that. So it's interesting what Dara says here. It's just a general, a general principle. He says that when history shall have ceased to be a conspiracy against the truth, you say today when, when the news ceases to be a conspiracy against the truth, <laughs> Uh, when the passions and prejudices by which the successive governments of England have been unwittingly swayed shall have yielded to cool reflection and impartiality, there will be what but one voice to brand the executioners and exalt their victims. Which, uh, that's true. I mean, now, centuries later, you can't think of the people uh, like Elizabeth or people who worked for her without a you know, certain loathing <laughs> for what they did. Uh, and it's also, it's a general principle that the, the church, of course, it will survive all of these, any horrible government that she has to deal with, the church will survive that. Now, maybe after many martyrs have died, but still, uh, the church will survive it after however much oppression she suffers. And you know, governments, regimes come and go, even in the most powerful of nations. So they, uh, uh, the church just has to wait it out, <laughs> in a sense. Because that doesn't exclude the fact there'll be a tremendous amount of suffering, but still. So the, uh, the reign of Elizabeth witnessed the rise uh, in England of the sect of the Brownists, who were the followers of Robert Brown. Talk about a boring name. <laughs> Brown. <laughs> uh, they were fanatical Puritans whose only worship was inward prayer. So I mean, a, a very common name for somebody starting a dangerous sect like this. Um, the Anabaptists also established themselves in Elizabeth's kingdom while another branch of the sect was formed under the name of the United Brethren or Moravians. So they're all, all various flavors of Anabaptists. Anybody remember what the Anabaptists, what their main tenet was? Anybody remember? Yes. Uh, essentially, essentially saying that, that it's necessary. Of course, I mean, we know that anybody who's a convert who has not been baptized has to be baptized as an adult convert to the Catholic faith, but they held that infant baptism was worthless, that it, you have to have the use of reason in order to um, essentially have the virtue of faith uh, to be cleansed of original sin. You have to have the use of reason to be validly baptized. That, that's what they, that was their main tenet, that adult baptism is necessary and ba infant baptism is worthless. So, back now, looking at, you know, so we're, we're, we're still getting a, a general overview of the, uh, of the state of things during the reign of, Greg, beginning of the reign of Gregory XIII. Uh, Germany was the scene of 
what Daras calls the most animated and lively religious discussions, which is rather euphemistic. Uh, Ferdinand I was succeeded on the imperial throne by Emperor Maximilian II, although actually that, that happened before the beginning of the reign of Gregory XIII, that was in 1564, but I'm still just getting an overview here. Uh, their reigns were but a succession of negotiations with the Protestants, who multiplied their confessions and formulas of faith without ever coming any nearer to unity. So they're trying to bring the Protestants under control here. Maybe grant them some concessions, uh, and, but nevertheless, you know, Protestant confessions means professions of faith. Uh, they're, well, in reality, there are various heretical formulas, but they're not getting anywhere with these people. They're very hard-headed heretics. So they were successively occupied, very much so, in endeavoring to maintain an equilibrium between their Catholic and Protestant subjects. So trying to keep things stable. But they lacked the power and the, uh, Tarsus is the word, the genius necessary and the, the skills and the general resources necessary to triumph over the difficulties of an inextricable situation. So again, also remember that the emperors were rather limited. The Holy Roman emperors were rather limited in their power over the empire. And Okay, so then the Emperor Maximilian II uh, died, and Rudolf II succeeded him in 1576. So this is during the reign of Pope Gregory XIII. Uh, Gregory XIII admonished him to send an ambassador to Rome for the purpose of soliciting the confirmation of his authority by the Holy See. So you may remember that Maximilian, or that or other, I, forget, I think it was... It was Ferdinand was uh, and Maximilian also. I believe both of them did not do that, and that was a big deal because it had always been done again since the year eight eight hundred. Every single Holy Roman Emperor had always received confirmation from the Holy See, and all of a sudden they stopped doing that. It was really out of defiance to the Holy See. There's no reason they would not do that. It's not like the Pope would uh, had had it out for them or something like that. He would have. He was clearly, clearly willing to, uh, but they they didn't do it. Uh, but you know, with this, with Rudolf II, Gregory the Thirteenth admonishes him to do that, and was really let's make sure you do that and act, you know, um, go through all of these you know, procedures correctly. So the new emperor was at first inclined to follow the example of Ferdinand and Maximilian, who had refused to ask the sovereign pontiff's sanction for their election. But he was finally convinced that the step would actually enhance the splendor of his own crown and that an emperor need not blush at an act of submission in which Charlemagne gloried. So he says, oh, make me look better. I'll do it, sure. So maybe not, maybe not the best of motives, but it's good that he did it in itself. And then uh, another interesting uh, bit of uh, crisis from this time from Portugal, a rather unexpected source of trouble. Uh, actually, wait, yeah, we'll cover that next time. I don't want to get into it all now.